Traditionally, fathers are the ones who are working hard to provide for the needs of the family, right? In fact, everybody traditionally is expecting them to do that responsibility. Fathers have to work. Fathers have to find a way to earn a living in order to put food on the table for the family and to pay for all the bills. And it's good because uh, traditionally, fathers have embraced this duty. In fact, many people, both the fathers and people around them, viewed this uh, responsibility to provide as the primary, if not the only responsibility of fathers. However, in our day and age, women also do the same thing, right? Most of the women nowadays are also career women. They have work. They earn a living, right? They also do the same thing. Now, it's not only the fathers who are working hard to provide for the needs of the family. Mothers or women are doing the same, right? And so you ask, what are fathers for nowadays, right? In fact, there are families where it's the mother who is earning a living and the father is just managing the household. And so you can't help but ask the question, if this is the case now, what purpose do fathers still have? The feminists would say, that's what we've been telling you for many years now. Men are useless. They're redundant, obsolete. Really? I couldn't disagree more. One, how can these women have all these cute little babies and adorable children without fathers? Two, oh, sorry, we're getting out of the topic. <laughs> but you see, many people fail to realize that actually both men and women contribute in a unique way to the parenting process. That's why we need fathers, not only mothers. So what's a father for? Today I'm going to share with you six contributions of fathers to the parenting process. Okay, are you ready? Six contributions of fathers to the parenting process. They have a purpose. We are not outdated. We are not outmoded. We are not obsolete. We are not redundant. We still have so many purposes to fulfill. Number one, one contribution of fathers, of a father to parenting process is this. Fa- a father provides physical and emotional security. A father provides physical and emotional security. You see, fathers by nature are strong, right? And also, by nature, they are protective. They're always concerned about the, the safety, the protection of their children. They're very protective. In fact, uh, they are so protective that fathers basically are willing to die or to give up their life just to protect their children from any harm given the opportunity or when there's a need, right? They're just so protective. In our home, uh, since I'm a father, it's very natural for me to always think of the, the safety of my children, my family, my wife, and my children. And so basically at night, although they already close the, you know, the, 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 the lock the doors, they lock the windows, everything, I would make it a point to check all those doors, all those windows, over and over again, not just once, but twice or twice. As a father, I'm protective of my family, right? So much so, that children, especially when they're still young, when their fathers are around, they feel so secure. In fact, when they are afraid, they look for dad. Where's dad? And when their father is around, they feel secure because dad is Superman. Is there to protect them. Now, fathers not only provide uh, physical security or protection, they also provide emotional security. Fathers provide emotional security. You see, when a dad hugs his child, the child feels so loved, feels so accepted, he feels so secure. When dad recognizes the accomplishments of the child, when he says, you are a good boy, you are intelligent, you are talented, the child feels so loved, feels so accepted. He, you know, he has this sense of worth 
and he feels emotionally secure. Right? So fathers do not, do not only provide physical security, but also emotional security. When he does these things, the emotional tank of his children gets filled. And that, when his emo, the emotional tank of the children gets filled, they feel so secure. You see, emotional security is very important, specifically to our children, because the lack of it at home because of a father who does not provide it or because of a father who is not around, I tell you, many times will tempt children to look for emotional security, to look for love, acceptance, and sense of worth in the wrong places. And I tell you, that's dangerous. We've heard of many stories of children, especially adolescents, getting their sense of worth, trying to receive love and acceptance from bad peers and look where it led them, right? Or maybe from the opposite sex and look where it led them. According to studies, when a dad is not present in a home, this is what happens. A teen is more likely to drop out of school. When a dad is not present in a home to give emotional security, a teen is more likely to be involved in crime, violence, drugs, and alcohol. His grades will be lower, and a girl is 50% more apt to become pregnant out of wedlock. But on the contrary, according to Dr. George Reckers, a positive and continuous relationship to one's father has been found to be associated with a good self-concept higher self-esteem, higher self-confidence in personal and social interaction, higher moral maturity, reduced rates of unwed teen pregnancy, greater internal control, and higher career aspirations. Fathers who are affectionate, nurturing, and actively involved in child rearing are more likely to have well-adjusted children. We see here the importance of emotional security, right? And fathers provide not only physical security, but also emotional security. Who says fathers are useless? Number two, a father also helps define gender-based roles and needs. This is another contribution of fathers to the parenting process. A father helps define gender-based roles and and needs. You see, just by faithfully uh, fulfilling his role as a father to his children and a husband to his wife, I tell you, fathers are teaching their children by example the gender-based roles based on the Bible. Let me give you an example. When a dad works hard to provide for the needs of the family, his kids see that actually it's the primary responsibility of men, specifically fathers, to provide for the family, right? And so the, when sons grow up, since that was the example that they, that they uh, uh, had when they were still growing up, they naturally want to provide for the family as men, right? Not only that, when fathers protect, protect his, their families, the kids realize that men ought to be protectors of their families. They're not there to hurt their wife. They're not there to hurt their children, but they're there to protect, to do anything, to shield their family from any threats from the outside. When a father loves and cares for his wife, the kids learn that fathers ought to love or men ought to love and care for women. They're not there as dictators. They're not there as bullies. They're there to love and protect their respective wives and their children. When a father leads the family, the kids learn that men ought to be the head in the family. Right? So by just faithfully fulfilling his unique responsibility at home, unique responsibility toward his wife and toward his children, actually men or fathers are teaching their children by example, about the biblical gender-based roles. Not only that, 
When fathers often spend time with their children and interact with them, the children also discover the needs of the man. Right? For example, men need respect first and foremost. As the kids are growing up, they will see that dad really needs respect. <laughs> right? He also needs admiration. You know, his ego, the male ego is so sensitive. Right? And as the dad spends time with the children, he interacts with them, the children get to know his needs. And they also learn how to meet those needs. This is another contribution of fathers to the parenting process. He helps define gender-based roles and needs. Number three, a father also serves as a very influential role model. Again, a father serves as a very influential role model. We have this uh, family friend uh, back in the States. The father or the husband uh, is very meticulous when it comes to cleanliness or neatness or orderliness. You know, I stayed with them for a few months, uh, many, many years ago, and I noticed firsthand how he was so, so clean. When he does household chores, he was very systematic, very meticulous in many ways. And so since this friend of ours, the father, was like this, he also wanted to train his children, especially his son, in these ways, in his clean and neat and orderly way. And so he taught early on his son to be neat, to be clean, to be orderly. However, the son didn't like it. In fact, when he already reached his adolescent years, he just resented his father. He found his father very strict, so meticulous. He found his father so overly meticulous. And so he resented it, you know. And he did, you know, Everything that was against what his father wanted. Like the father wanted a clean and orderly room. He just messed up his room, you know, sprayed paint on the wall, you know, those things. It was very, you know, a trying times for the whole family during the time. Now let's fast forward to the future. The son is now an adult. He now has a wife. In fact, he has been with the Navy, I think, for 13 years now. U.S. Navy. Now, one day, the daughter-in-law, the wife of the son, had a talk with her parents-in-law. And in the course of the talk, the daughter-in-law said, Mom and Dad, you know what? Oh, it's just so difficult to stay in the same house with your son. And the parents said, why? The daughter-in-law said, you know, you know what, Dad? He's so meticulously clean. In need, in orderly, you should see dad and mom, how he takes care of his car, how he spends so, you know, so many hours just cleaning it, everything, every space, every part of the car. You should see how he cleans his, you know, his shoes, his bed, his room, our house. Boy, it's so strict, it's so meticulous. When the parents heard, heard that, they were laughing <laughs> because they knew how much they struggled with their son over these things. What do we see here? We see the very strong influence of a father on his son. He didn't even have to say anything, right? Just live in this way and his son follows suit eventually. And this is not only true of sons, but also of daughters. In an article entitled, How Fathers Influence Daughters, Dr. Alessandro Simons, Associate Clinical Professor of Psychiatry in the New York University School of Medicine, made a study of women who had high commitments to work. And this is what she said. Most of the studies show that the highest percentage of women who aspire to careers have been encouraged or influenced by men, their fathers usually. So we see here that indeed fathers are, have very strong influence on their children, both on the sons or even on the daughters. That's why, according to studies, only 15%, again, only 15% of children will go to church when they're already adult if only the mother goes to church when they are still young. I repeat, fathers, listen to this. 
According to studies, only 15% of children will go to church when they're already adult if only the mother goes to church. However, according to the same studies, 55%, 55% of these children will attend church when they are already old if it's the father who goes to church when they were still growing up. Of course, if both parents go, we have a bigger percentage. It's at 72%. 72% of children will also attend church when they grow up if they uh, see their parents going to church, both of them going to church when they were still growing up. What do we see here? Again, we see that fathers serve as a very strong influence on their children. Another contribution of fathers to the parenting process. Number four, a father provides for the needs of the family. Of course, we all know this. A father provides for the needs of the family. Traditionally, it's the fathers who work hard, find a living in order to put food on the table, right? To pay for the education of children and to pay for just about anything that the whole family needs, right? This is very instinctive to the fathers. In our home, as a father, I don't want my children to spend any cent. Of course, they don't have a money of their own. Their allowance comes from me. But even then, when we go out and I'm with them, they want to buy food. Even if they have uh, some allowance, when I'm present, I make it a point that I will pay for those purchases. Not only needs, but even wants. You know, from time to time, my, I would discover that they bought uh, uh, a school supply or something that they need out of their own allowance. And I would some sort of scold them. Why, did you, why didn't you ask me? Why did you use your allowance to buy your uh, school needs? I would have paid for it. That's the heart of a father. Whether right or wrong, right? But you see, I have a, a wise wife. So from time to time, she would tell me, just let them pay. I said, but that's, you know, that's a school need. That's their clothes I have to pr provide. Just let them pay for it. And she said, you know what? If you keep on paying for them, they will be too, depend too dependent on you. And they will not learn to provide for their own needs. And I said, you've got a point. But of course, deep in my heart, I still want to pay for everything that they need. That's the heart of a father. A father provides for the needs of the family. And fathers are willing to go anywhere and do anything just to, to meet the needs of his family, right? Since our country economically is not really doing well, we see many fathers going out of the country as OFWs, right? Overseas uh, Filipino workers going out there, exposing themselves to, to danger, living uh, alone or maybe uh, living uh, and working outside in countries that are not really safe like the Middle East. Just to earn a living for the family. That's the heart of a father. And let's not take this for granted. I understand many families, specifically children nowadays, are complaining about the fact that many of their fathers do not have time for them. They don't spend enough time to be with them. And in our day and age, this is one of the, the, the biggest complaints that people in the society are throwing against the fathers. They say, oh, what's the money for? Even if you will, you know, send us to good schools and you will give us all the things that we need, we need more than this. We need time, Dad. We need your love, da, 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 da. Oh, I understand that, okay? But let's not take it to the other extreme, okay? Let's not take for granted that our fathers are providing for our needs, that they are working so hard finding ways to... to put food on a table to send us to good schools. I tell you, if you complain about, you know, the other things and you take for granted the fact that your fathers are providing uh, for your needs, doing their best to provide for your needs, you go ask children who didn't have fathers while growing up to provide for their needs. Did you hear that? 
You complain about, uh, you don't appreciate your fathers anymore for their provision for you. You go and ask children who grew up without fathers to provide for their needs. You ask me. Because I lost my father when I was still young. Of course, we lost our fathers in different ways, right? The father dies when you were still young or the father abandoned you. Either way, without the father to provide for the needs, I tell you, it's a very difficult life. Really. In fact, when I was studying after high school, I thought I won't get to college. I thought I was just going to study a vocational course. Surprised? Really, Pastor? Really? If not for my heavenly father who sent me to school, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you. And my heavenly father is so good. He did not only send me to college, he also sent me to master's to study master for my master's and even to get my doctorate degree. But if not for my heavenly father, where will I be? So children, don't forget, let's not take this for granted. Our fathers may be flawed in many ways, but let's be appreciative of the fact that they work hard to provide for our needs. Okay, that's another contribution of fathers to the parenting process. They provide for the needs of the family. Number five, a father also fixes things when they are broken. A father fixes things when they are broken. You still remember you were still young and you broke your toy. Where did you go to? Of course, dad. If you happen to go to mom first, mom says, Bring it to your dad. <laughs> Let him fix it. Your bicycle, when your bicycle is broken, you go to dad. When furnitures in the house are broken, dad fixes them, right? And so on and so forth. Generally, by nature, dads are good at fixing things and even assembling things. In our house, when we buy something that needs assembling, my wife would call me, you assemble this. You read the manual. You figure this out. <laughs> And I would do it for her. That's just how, the, uh, that's just the way it is. God wired many men in this way. Now, actually, dads are also good at solving problems. You know, when there are problems, they take charge, especially the big ones. They know that they just have to step up, and they step up, they analyze it objectively, and decisively makes that decision. Of course, mothers are also very good. But many times in the end, mothers would go to the father, how do we solve this? What's our decision? And here comes dad, the fixer of all problems, Superman. Analyzes it without any emotion, objectively, and he hands down his judgment, his decision. That's it. A father fixes things when they are broken. Last but not the least, another contribution of a father is, he prepares children for the real world. He prepares children for the real world. Now, since fathers know the dangers out there in the real world, you know, since he knows that how the real world operates, a father naturally imparts survival skills to his children. That's why many times you would see, you know, when fathers and children have this talk, the father is always, you know, giving uh, survival skills, uh, advices to the children. When you go out, do this. Don't do that. He gives advices to them because he's been there, out there for many years, working, facing all those dangers, those threats, and he knows how the world operates and the dangers lurking behind. So as a father, he naturally prepares his children for the real world. When a child falls, usually the mother would pick up the child and hug the child and kiss the child, you know, and uh, comfort the child. 
But on the contrary, when it's the father who sees the child falling, what does he do? Naturally. He will not pick up the child and uh, hug the child and kiss the child and, you know, cry with the child. No, no way. He will just say to the child, stand up. Oh, there's nothing. There's no blood. It's okay. It's okay. You, you, you return to, to play. Don't make a big deal out there. Don't cry. Don't you cry. Be a man. Is he being mean? Or is that it? No. Fathers are here to prepare children for the real world. They prepare them to become emotionally strong because they know out there it's an unforgiving world. Right? It's a dog-eat-dog world. So they give them insights, they encourage them, they make them strong so that they will be, uh, be ready to face all challenges in the world. Now, who says the fathers are useless? Right? In closing, let me share with you a fictitious story about what happened when God created fathers. Let me read this article to you. When the good Lord was creating fathers, he started with a tall frame. And the female angel nearby said, Lord, what kind of father is that? If you're going to make children so close to the ground or small children, why have you put fathers up so high? He won't be able to shoot marbles without kneeling, tuck a child in bed without bending, or even kiss a child without a lot of stooping. And God just smiled and said, Yes, but if I make the father child size, who would children have to look up to? And when God made the father's hands, they were large and sinewy. And the angel shook her head sadly and said, Lord, do you know what you're doing? Large hands are clumsy. They can't manage diaper pins. They can't manage small buttons, rubber bands on ponytails, or even splinters caused by baseball bats. And God just smiled and said, I know, but they're large enough to hold everything a small boy empties from his pockets at the end of a day yet small enough to cup a child's face in his hands. And then God molded long, slim legs and broad shoulders. And the angel nearly had a heart attack. He said, boy, this is the end of the week. All right. She clucked. Lord, do you realize you just made the father without a lap? How is he going to pull a child close to him? without the kid falling between his legs. And God just smiled and said, a mother needs a lap. A father needs strong shoulders to pull a sled, to balance a boy on a bicycle, and hold a sleepy head on the way home from the circus. God was in the middle of creating two of the largest feet anyone had ever seen, when the angel could contain herself no longer. She said, Lord, that's not fair. Do you honestly think those large feet are going to dig out of bed early in the morning when the baby cries? Or walk through a small birthday party without crushing at least three of the guests? But God just smiled and said, they'll work. You'll see. They'll support a small child who wants to ride a horse to Banbury Cross or scare off mice at the summer cabin or display shoes that will be a challenge to fill. God continued his work. God worked throughout the night, giving the father only a few words. Many fathers are men of few words. Giving the father a few words, but a firm, authoritative voice. Eyes that saw everything, but remained calm and tolerant. Finally, almost as an afterthought, God added tears. Tears to the eyes of the Father. Then the Lord turned to the angel and said, Now, are you satisfied that he can love as much as a mother? And the angel shut up. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, our fathers 
are flawed in many ways. They are imperfect in many ways. I should know I'm a father too. Right? But you see, they're God's gifts to us. So while we still have time with them, let's appreciate them. Let's express our appreciation for them. Let's honor them. If we can, let's tell them we love you. We appreciate everything that you did for us. We thank you so much. Today, it's Father's Day. Don't forget to greet your fathers and express your appreciation for them. For those people here whose fathers are not here, living somewhere else, pick up the phone, call them, write them a letter. If you are shy, uh, you're, you're shy to, to say those words because they need to hear those words after all these years of loving you, guiding you, taking care of you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for fathers you have given to us in one way or the other, if not in more than one ways. Lord God, you have used them to bless us. Thank you for these fathers. We pray, God, that we will follow after the example, the good example that they have shown to us, that we ourselves will be good parents to our own children, just like them. And we pray, God, that you will bless our fathers. You will affirm them. You will encourage them. You will give them long life and good health. For we ask all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.